Good morning once again, everyone. Um, just a little reminder, we're going to get started in this room. This is uh, part of the tools, rules, and people stream. So if you're participating in this next session, wow, this thing really moves. Um, I just encourage you to come up closer because there's going to be some collaboration in this next session, all right? And uh, some discussion and engagement. So if you're sticking around for this one, it's super cool. Come on up here to the tables. There's lots of space. And uh, I'm going to bring up our speaker in about one minute. Thank you. All right, so here we go. We're going to get this thing going. This next little uh, working session is called Wisdom of the Crowd. We have a lovely guest speaker here from LAC, or Library and Archives Canada. And she's a project manager. She's going to come and speak to us about this super cool tool that they developed uh, called Colab. So let's welcome her up to the stage, Alexandra Hegert. Hello. Um, please come sit at tables. You're going to be talking to other people and hopefully they don't bite. So come and discuss. Um, today uh, I'm going to be telling you about um, a new application developed in-house at Library and Archives Canada. And some of the developers are in the crowd, so shout out to them. And uh, this application is a crowdsourcing tool. Library and Archives Canada holds so many uh, pieces of Canada's history. Um, there are textual records, photographs, uh, diaries, newspapers, maps, drawings, pieces of art. There are so many different types of material that Library and Archives Canada holds. And I'm going to preface this conversation by saying that I'm not a developer. <laughs> I am not in tech, actually, unless you count partnering with uh, our IT branch to build amazing tools like this one. Um, my name is Alex Haggart. I'm a project manager in a group called Online Content. Uh, at Library and Archives, our team runs, um, we have a blog, we have a very popular podcast series, we have a Flickr account, uh, we've run two successful ebooks, and now we have Colab. So I'm going to do a little bit of a video demo and just to walk you through how the tool works and what it does. And then after that, I'm going to do a very short presentation on why we built the tool and how we built the tool and where we want to go next. And then we're going to sort of do a roundtable discussion, and I'm going to turn the questions over to you to answer questions, not ask me questions yet. Um, and hopefully, we'll come up with some new ideas, some fresh new perspectives on what crowdsourcing could mean for the government. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to reserve a few minutes to address any questions that you might have for me. So I'm going to start with this video. So this is Colab, and our team in online content has built this tool. Nope. <laughs> yep. So our team in online content is putting together. Is it playing? Give it a second. Um, can't decide what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, so our team in online content is putting together what we're calling challenges of basically thematically related content. Uh, some stuff is regarding uh, indigenous heritage. Some stuff is regarding military heritage. Um, if really any sort of topic that might be of interest to diverse crowds. Uh, we put them together in a challenge, and a challenge can contain many tasks, uh, and each task is a set of images. And we're asking the public to look through these sets of images, these tasks, select one that they want to work on, and do some type of contribution. And there are four types of contribution that can take place. There's transcription of textual material, translation in English and French, 
There's tagging, both on the image tagging and keyword tagging. And then there's description fields that can be completed by the crowd. So I'm going to show this one. It's uh, Rosemary Gilead's Arctic Diary. She was a freelance photographer hired by the government in the summer of 1960 to go to the north. She took many photos, and she also kept an extremely detailed 400-plus page diary. Uh, it's all handwritten. It's uh, full of incredible stories and incredible bits of information that uh, uh, is only described basically at the item level. So it's the diary itself is described by an archivist. It's simply not feasible, sorry, I'm going to speed up. Uh, it's simply not feasible for archivists to actually transcribe information and add metadata per image. So we have what we call the contribution interface. And here a user is given the opportunity to log in if they'd like to create a user account. So far, the real benefit to logging in is that we track the contribution history of the user. Uh, but that's something we want to build on and uh, build more functionality into that. Then they're brought to this screen. On the left-hand side, they see what we call the harmonized viewer. Uh, this viewer allows for deep zoom. It doesn't change the resolution of the image, um, but our images are scanned at a pretty decent resolution, uh, or put online at a pretty decent resolution, and it's useful to be able to sort of manipulate that image on screen while you're transcribing it or looking at uh, maybe individuals in a photograph. Um, the user's also given a quick option to print or download a copy. And then the right-hand side is where those four types of contribution take place. So transcription, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's transcription of text that appears on a textual document. Uh, it's a plain text box, but we have lots of information in our guidelines and in our tutorial. <laughs> so, yep. So we have lots of information in our guidelines and in our tutorial about um, how, to, how to denote when a word is illegible, for example, or when you're not certain of the spelling, or for when a note has been made in the margins, as you can see on this, uh, this example. There's lots of little notes. Uh, this is a, a packing list um, for Rosemary Gilead and her uh, friend Barbara Hines' trip to the north. Is it playing? Okay. Uh, the second type of contribution is translation. So you can actually see somebody has gone and translated this into French. So they've taken the English textual transcription and translated it. Um, this is incredible because it makes uh, this document accessible to unilingual Canadians. So um, another big benefit of having this text transcribed and translated is that all of this text becomes searchable metadata. And I'll show you a little bit more about how that works. Um, for translation, we're also looking at expanding on this area, and we're hoping to start to include Indigenous languages. So we're working with our Indigenous Advisory Circle at Library and Archives to uh, figure out how best to do that, respecting the complexity of numerous dialects. Then we have tagging, and like I said, we have two types. We have on-the-image tagging, and then we have keyword tagging, which is displayed here. Uh, so somebody, members of the crowd, have gone and added these keywords to this specific image. So you see keywords like equipement or expedition. Um, <clears throat> and then we have description. So you might be wondering why would you need a description when the archivist actually does write a description with all these fields. Um, so there's two reasons for that. So one reason, um, which you'll see a little bit more when I talk about project naming, which there's uh, cards on the table about project naming, is that sometimes the public knows more than the institution about the item, especially when it comes to photographs that somebody might be able to recognize, maybe an individual or a physical object or a location in a photograph that was not necessarily possible by the archivist when it was described. The second reason is that this description is per image. So like I said, this diary is over 400 pages long, and an archivist has gone and written a description for the 400-page diary. But this description right here says Rosemary Gilead's equipment list, which is not relevant for other images in this collection. It's only relevant for this specific image. So after a user saves that, all of that information becomes searchable metadata. And that's just one type of contribution that we can do. So um, Colab, we put together challenges. Uh, but there's also an option to contribute in collection search beta. So this is Library and Archive's new search tool, just launched in 2018, as well as Colab. Um, users can search by keyword and have their tabs across the top, types of separating the content. They have limiter options on the left-hand menu. 
And then I'm just going to show you a result. Um, this is related to tunnels near Vimy Ridge. Now, this is uh, the archival record itself. So this is the description that has been written by the archivist. Uh, these are the details that we know about the record itself. And then we have the digital objects. So there's that image. And when we open that image, it's actually going to open in that harmonized viewer. So we've introduced a new way of viewing images in the collection, not just in collection or not just in collab itself. So here we have our viewer. Once again, uh, the user has the ability to scroll in and do a deep zoom. Um, you can see the faces of these men a lot more clearly there. And below the viewer, we have collab content. So this is where contributions would appear. But this image has not been part of a challenge. Online content, our team has not put it together as part of a challenge. But that doesn't mean that we can't actually contribute to it. So we're actually um, empowering the public to enable any image available in a collection search beta for collab contributions. All they have to do is answer two, maybe three short questions. If it was text, they would have to specify which language it appeared in. And when they hit submit, it's going to open Colab in a new tab. They're brought directly into that contribution interface. And because they selected that it was a photograph, tagging and description are turned on, uh, turned on and transcription and translation are not. So as a demonstration, uh, I'm just going to add a keyword here. So uh, pick you know, something related to the image. These are just for examples, so they might not be the best keywords. Um, but when I add a keyword, you'll see uh, a little sort of tag symbol. And then this is that image tagging that I talked about. So it's sort of a Facebook-like experience. Um, if you have, if there's something on the image itself that needs to sort of be located with a tag, you can do that. So I chose to tag the YMCA flag. And you can see that that's marked with sort of a map icon specifying a location on the image. Now I set the status to incomplete. We've got four statuses, not started, incomplete, um, needs review, and complete. And after I save that, the, if I go back and refresh my results, or maybe the next person is doing research and comes upon this image, the next time they open it in that section below, now they're going to see what Colab content is, a little bit of a disclaimer about Colab, uh, and they're going to see the tags itself. So the metadata add is immediate. It's truly instant. Um, it becomes searchable after 24 hours, so we index the data every night. Um, but the actual presence in the archives is instant. So that's Colab. And uh, I think I'm OK on time. I'm going to jump into the presentation. Not that one. <laughs> All right, so in true crowdsourcing fashion, uh, I'd like to invite you to submit any questions via Slido, or if you haven't come up with a question on your own, but you see one that you'd like to have answered on Slido, you can upvote it, and the you know, most rated ones get sent to the top. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room probably has some sort of internet connected device, so I hope that that's sufficient. Uh, but if you truly don't, uh, there'll be a time at the end, I'll see if there are any offline questions. Um, next. So in order to talk about crowdsourcing at LAC, I have to talk about project naming. Uh, crowdsourcing is not really a new practice at Library and Archives. And in fact, this is a program that has been happening for 16 years. And it's quite difficult to sum up in just two slides. But I'm going to try. Back in 2002, uh, this was really a citizen-driven initiative. There were um, students and professors at a local school called Nunavut Saivanuksavut, a school for Inuit uh, students from Nunavut in Ottawa. They were here doing, uh, learning about their community, learning about their culture, and their instructors brought them down to the archives. It's a school located on Rideau Street downtown. The instructors brought them for a walk down to 395 Wellington, our main building, and uh, looked in the card catalogs for photographs of their community. Now, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the photographs taken by the government or by government representatives or by photographers hired by the government, um, when those photos were described or captioned by the photographer, they named anybody in the photograph who was white. They didn't name the indigenous people that appeared in the photographs. Uh, often, those people were labeled with derogatory terms or things like native type. Um, which, of course, uh, needs to be addressed. 
And so project naming was sort of born as a response to that issue and that very, very common issue in the archives. So project naming started as a collaboration between Nunavut, Saiv, and Uxavit, having their students uh, take photocopies of these photographs or uh, later putting them on CDs or DVDs, bringing them home over the winter holiday break to their hometowns in Nunavut and sitting and talking with elders. The uh, territorial government of Nunavut actually got involved, their cultures, language, elders and youth department, library and archives, and uh, Nunavut, Saiv, and Uxavit got together and project naming was born. It started with an agreement to digitize just 500 photographs from Richard Harrington's collection. And it grew into an enormous program. We had a database, and this is a snippet of the uh, database um, naming form, where um, community members were invited to identify the names and sometimes stories and context of the people that appeared in the photographs. It then grew into uh, events hosted in local communities. So these are a couple of photographs where um, individuals, especially elders, were able to reconnect with photos that uh, some of them are of their parents or of themselves that they may have not known were being taken by a government photographer and put into the you know, national record. <laughs> Um, so it was so popular and for 13 years uh, it was focused entirely on uh, 26 Inuit communities in Nunavut. So we didn't want to stop there. In 2015 the project was expanded to include all indigenous groups in Canada, um, living in Canada. The Métis Nation, um, Inuit and First Nations are invited to identify individuals and photographs and Library and Archives Canada will update the record to reflect the truth behind the, the photograph. Next. Um, and of course, with an expanded uh, reach, looking at um, Indigenous people living all across Canada, uh, that meant we, need to, we needed to change our tactics a little bit. We couldn't host community events everywhere all the time. That just wouldn't be feasible. And so we turned online, and we specifically turned to social media to grow the project. In um, 2015, Library and Archives social media pages started a Throwback Thursday initiative where they would share one project naming photo every Thursday. Um, and it became a place for discussions like this. So this is a conversation between members of the same family um, who are you know, tagging each other and pointing out to each other um, that they're related to this individual, that this photo is there. Um, <clears throat> And it really became, Facebook in particular, became a space for that discussion to happen in the comments section. In 2017, in response to how popular this was for two years, uh, and in recognition of the 15th anniversary of project naming, we launched our own dedicated social media channels. So you'll see those on the cards on the tables. Shout out to at Project Naming on Facebook and Twitter. Please go follow us. Um, we actually have expanded to share three photos a week rather than just the one Throwback Thursday photo. And we have about a 30 to 40% success rate at identifying some part of that photo. So sometimes it's an individual's name, sometimes it's an approximate date, sometimes it's a location, and sometimes it's a full story about when the photo was taken and what was happening in it. Next. So that brings us to crowdsourcing today and how project naming and uh, photos are not the only records that we can sort of harness this power and this interest of the crowd. So to give you a little bit of an idea, this is just a snippet of the size of Lack's collection. Um, there's over 30 million photographs. That's one photo for every Canadian. Um, there are 250 kilometers of textual records. That's not page by page, that's pages stacked. Um, it's, it's huge. Um, it's simply, this is to show that it's simply not feasible to expect for professional transcription, translation, tagging, and that addition of metadata to, to be done. It's not feasible. There would be, you know, pretty much no way unless we employed tens of thousands of ind individuals for the sole purpose of doing that. Um, so in 2015, 2016, we did sort of these partner pilot projects with Our Digital World. Uh, we. In 2015, we did the Coltman Report, which is an over 400-page handwritten document um, from the Battle of Seven Oaks, or about the Battle of Seven Oaks. And we launched it um, as a transcription project on this uh, Our Digital World platform. We 
launched it, I believe, in July of 2015, and we planned on doing sort of a communications push in the fall. We were kind of, this was very, very much a pilot, so we were planning on doing communications push in the fall, um, but we didn't end up getting to use all those communications products because it was done in six weeks. So the public just jumped in, there was this huge interest, and within six weeks, the entire 400-plus uh, page document was transcribed, was tagged, and there was all this metadata that we could then turn around and put available in our collection. Then we did, in 2016, uh, or 2017, sorry, uh, Lady McDonald's Diary. So this was about a 90-page handwritten diary, uh, but we wanted to try it again just to see if the interest was the same. And yes, it was. <laughs> the diary was finished in less than two months. Um, and we actually had the public asking for more. So all the while, while these pilot projects were taking place, behind the scenes we were developing CoLab. Now, um, the reason that we needed to develop a tool uh, in-house, rather than continuing this partnership with Our Digital World, although it was an incredible partnership, was um, we needed to be able to have that data speak directly to our databases. So um, obviously when we had the Our Digital World platform, we got basically an Excel spreadsheet at the end and then we have to import all that data and there's a lot of manual processes there. So we needed to be able to speak to our databases and our own applications. So Colab was born. <laughs> Um, and while we were working on Collab, we were looking at other institutions. So it's important to note that LAC is not necessarily the first in this area. Um, and other institutions like uh, the National Archives Records Administration in the United States, they've had their citizen archivist tool at the bottom right here for 10 years now. So we're playing a little bit of catch up, but we're also trying to take the lessons learned from other institutions and put them in practice. So we spoke to these other institutions, we looked at their results, we looked at how their tools worked, and kind of incorporated bits and pieces of everything into our own tool. Um, like I said, we're falling behind like-minded institutions and basically it's, it's um, the sooner we jumped on this and um, the sooner we harnessed the interest that was already present, the faster we would be able to start in, um, improving the metadata in our own collection. And we did have some challenges along the way. So notably, there's a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of concern, maybe a lot of concern, coming from the archival profession. Uh, and we needed to make sure that we were going to balance the respect for the professional archival um, work that's being done to catalog records, to write descriptions, um, but also allow for the benefits that could come from opening our collection to the public. So it's kind of a little bit of a culture change and in introducing that, that let's look at our clients as partners and not so much as clients because our partners, the public, wants to interact with the record. They want to do more than just look at it on a screen or fill out a manual form and request a reproduction of a document. They want to do something with it. So this way we were giving them that opportunity, but also um, balancing how it's presented in our collection search beta. So I'll show you a little bit about that after. Um, and then the other thing is I think happening across the government in every uh, business and IT partnership is getting away from the idea of throwing things over the fence at each other uh, and not working together like partners. So we need to overcome that. Uh, and then once we do have a finished product and we put it out there, we can't consider it finished. Uh, it needs to be something that we continue to work on, that we continue to maintain. And we need to have the commitment from senior management to do that. So that's something that we're approaching as well. Next. Um, so just a little note on language and accessibility. So obviously accessibility was a concern and we're um, making sure that that's kept in mind along the way. And then in terms of um, official languages and when it comes to indigenous languages as well, uh, right now we're trying to balance the content that we put out there in English and French so that we don't just put out challenges all with English related material, which is a little bit of a challenge for us because there is a lot of English language material. Um, and allowing the contributor to contribute in whatever language they would like to. So uh, even for those description fields, you can choose English or French within one record. Uh, you, the entire platform is bilingual, of course. So, next. So I showed you collection search beta. I just wanted to show you um, live on the website now. This is an old screen capture. Uh, it says collab content. This is before we had a name. Um, 
But that was a little bit of our, our addressing the concerns of the professional uh, archives community to make sure that the, um, the user, the public, when they're looking at the metadata, they know what comes from LAC and what comes from anyone. So we're using uh, this separate tab in our search results. We're using, um, on that search result, you saw the information cr uh, created by the archivist, and then only when you open the viewer do you see what's contributed by the crowd. So a little bit of separation. We're also making sure that we have a disclaimer when any collab content appears to make sure that people understand where it's from. Next. So these are a couple examples of Canadian graffiti. Um, the number one question that we get when we talk about collab to anyone, anywhere, ever, um, is what if somebody trolls you? What if somebody contributes offensive content? What if somebody just goes and maliciously um, deletes content or um, just adds a bunch of racist or inflammatory language? So um, this is a little bit of a boogeyman issue. It doesn't actually occur as much as we think it would occur. And that's where uh, we did talk to those other institutions. So we looked especially to NARA in the United States to find out over 10 years what has been the situation. So NARA requires a user login, but even um, with that small level of security, um, or a small level of, let's say, a little bit of a hurdle to jump over to be able to add content, um, they've had two issues in 10 years that their institution actually had to intervene. Um, we talked about including a blacklist of words, um, and then of course we dis discussed how um, the nature of history and, and you know, reflecting on what Canada's history includes. We can't create a blacklist of words because we need to accurately depict what happens in textual records. If you're transcribing a record from years ago that contains a word that is considered offensive, that would be a problem. So we don't have a blacklist. We decided to be a little more experimental than NARA and not require a user login. So far we're doing okay, but this is experimental. So it's something where maybe in the future we will require user logins. Um, maybe we'll change the way that we structure things. We'll see. Um, just to say that it is a consideration, but it's not as much of a concern that we all have. It's where everybody's mind immediately goes, um, but in reality it's not as big of a problem as we think. Okay, next. Um, so what could be next? The list is miles long. It's not um, possible to sum it up in one slide, but just a couple of ideas. So one thing that we have talked about is publishing the source code for Colab, or pieces of the source code for Colab, anything that might be usable. But there are challenges to overcome with that. Obviously, this application was built to work with LAX specific applications and databases, some of which are legacy, uh, and it may not be as easy as simply stripping the proprietary content and publishing it. We'll see. It's something we're looking at doing. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that this project was not started with the vision to publish source code. So something that may, you know, we'll, we'll tackle that challenge in the next couple of months. Um, other features and improvements. So I didn't mention at the beginning, but this launched in April 2018. So we've only had a couple months. Uh, we've already launched seven challenges. Hundreds and hundreds, let's say over 3,000, I believe, last week I checked, over 3,000 images have been enabled for crowdsourced content, either through challenges or by the crowd in co uh, collection search beta. Um, we're only just getting started. So there's so much we can do. Right now, the tool only works with JPEGs. And a lot of our collection are multi-page textual documents in PDF format. And this is just a matter of our digitization practices. Sometimes they decide to put JPEGs in online copies. Sometimes they decide to put PDFs. We'll see what we do with that. Um, <clears throat> so we're, uh, we're going to be working on how we can possibly take a multi-page PDF, split it apart, add the uh, collab content, and then piece it back together. We're working on it. Um, the user account profiles is a big area that I think could, could really um, benefit from future development. So maybe we can denote verified reviewers. Especially we talked about this with our Indigenous Advisory Circle just this week. Maybe we can denote um, community representatives to have certain functionalities in their user accounts that other people don't have. 
Um, there's so many possibilities. There's a little bit of gamification that's possible there too, giving out badges, recognizing uh, you know, the amount of work that's being done by people, um, and maybe you know, incentivizing that with some kind of reward. We'll see. Uh, I mentioned about indigenous language inputs. Uh, the viewer right now only holds JPEGs, as I said, and we're working on PDFs. But then we need to also look at audio video. There's a lot of audio video material in um, LAC's collection that's currently not really accessible unless you're able to come on site. So we need to build a viewer that can maybe allow for a viewing of a video once or a viewing of a video associated with your user account because we need to make sure that um, the copyright of that video is going to be respected. Um, AI. Of course, we need to talk about AI when it comes to crowdsourcing, especially when we're talking about transcription and tagging and metadata. Um, AI is not something we're ignoring at all. Um, we actually do OCR all of our PDF records at LAC, so when a multi-page textual document is, is created in a PDF format, it is automatically OCR'd. However, a lot of that OCR text is not yet perfect, and OCR is getting better, uh, but especially for handwritten documents, there's usually, usually human intervention that's still required. So there's steps that we could take to OCR textual documents, have that text appear in the transcription box, and then ask the crowd to start by correcting it instead of starting from scratch. We'll see. Uh, video indexing as well, adding metadata based on videos too. So, so many, so many things. Um, and part of our next segment, I think next, finished, um, is to actually have a discussion or, or you know, think on your own and fill out uh, this Lime survey put up a bit.ly code. I hope this works. This is a capital I, not an L. <laughs> Couldn't change the, the short URL after I created it. Yes, I can. Um, so I want to say feel free to participate as groups. Uh, it would be great if some discussion happens. Um, the Lime survey is sort of has a couple of streams, so you can answer sort of what area of work you do, and some questions will be tailored to that area. Um, and uh, we're going to take about 20 minutes to do this. And then I'm going to wrap it up with five minutes where I can respond to any of the Slido questions. Um, and I'm also going to kind of move around the room. So feel free to talk to me while you're filling out the Lyme survey as well. And Pierre-Luc Pilon is here too. And he's helping with the Lyme survey. So. Can you choose if that one works? <laughs> Um, oh, and on the tables, there are actually some printed out screen captures of the website, or of the application. So particularly if you have a UX design background, um, feel free to come and make notes. And then on the Lime survey, there's an option to take a picture and upload it. So if you want to make some physical notes on paper, feel free to do that and then take a picture and upload it. So uh, yeah, we're going to take just about 20 minutes to do that now.
I had a good question um, about Colab itself. So the application's live, anybody can access it. So if you want to take some time to explore it, uh, the URL is co-lab, colab, dot back dash lack dot gc dot ca. I wish it was simpler. You can also go to collectionscanada.gc.ca and it, find it from the homepage. So it's just at the bottom of the homepage.
Okay, I think I'm going to take a few minutes to answer some of the questions now and then we can finish out the um, survey kind of on your own time or whenever you'd like. Um, I'll put the link up on the GitHub site though, so if uh, you don't want to participate in the survey today but you do at a later date, feel free to. Um, again, the Slido is up here, so if you have any last minute questions, feel free to add them in. Um, I want to answer some of them because some of them are really great questions. So. One of these questions is, have you explored use of deep neural networks for image tagging and text description? Lots of mature research in area and crowd could validate. So uh, I touched on that a little bit when I talked about using AI. Um, we actually ran an AI pilot at Library and Archives this summer. Um, nothing published, but uh, our ICIOB branch, um, our IT branch, did do a pilot. And they used um, a couple of different tools, one of them being a Microsoft Video Indexer. And I actually got to watch a demo of that. So not textual transcription and tagging, but video transcription and tagging, which was really interesting. Um, some of the results were really cool. Um, and it's actually, um, I mean, there are different questions that LAC is going to face and other government departments are going to face regarding uh, when it comes to uh, tagging individuals or having individuals automatically recognized on video or photo. Um, but one thing that the Microsoft Video Indexer did that was interesting was identified when a person appeared in a video and timestamped that point and then you could add a tag, for example, with that person's name that would be attached to it. So we talked a little bit recently about there are a number of uh, videos from um, trips to um, Nunavut and the Northwest Territories in the Yukon um, in the government records from the 1950s, 1960s. So a similar time to when freelancers like Rosemary Gilead were being sent to the North to take photographs. Often they would, um, or government agents as well, would take video, but it would be not part of the official record. So when they'd return from their return from their government-sponsored travel, give their report in, they would provide the photos with the report. Often the video would not necessarily be attached to the report, but the video exists. So sometimes film was taken and the film is in the archives. A lot of that film has been digitized. And so um, kind of with the context of project naming and knowing the community that we have built over 17 years now, um, surrounding project naming and especially with Inuit communities in Nunavut, uh, there are a lot of videos uh, taken in Nunavut in the 1960s, similar to the photographs that we have that have been immensely popular through project naming. So that's an area where maybe we could explore using something like a video indexer to um, sort of do like an OCR version of, of tagging um, and then ask the public to get involved. Um, and yes, of course, I, I talked about OCR on text and that sort of thing that uh, we're looking at it and it's something that we're going to be, um, right now we've sort of got a plan in place for the PDFs and that's something where we'll be splitting apart the PDFs, OCRing them, the text for each page OCR will get put into the transcription box automatically and the crowd will be invited to edit it. But that's a few months away, so keep watching for it. Another great question. Uh, oh, okay, so I didn't really talk about this, but there's a number of questions about who reviews the transcriptions and tags, who moderates the content, and what intervention does LAC have in the content that's getting contributed. So we talked a little bit on that Canadian graffiti slide about um, how the crowd's contributions don't necessarily need to be moderated as much as we think they do. Um, but what LAC is actually doing in response to that concern is allowing the crowd to moderate the crowd. The crowd controls the crowd. So actually anybody can edit or delete or change a previously contributed piece of metadata, a transcription or tag or text. Um, yeah. No, so we're actually just saying, like, you are empowered to do what you deem necessary. Uh, we had just one second. We have a fail-safe time-stamped version so we can restore, for example, if somebody goes in and maliciously deletes an entire page of textual transcription, we can go and restore um, that. We have, uh, so far we have an email address, but that's one of the things we're looking at is maybe sort of making that communication with us a little easier to be able to flag certain problems or say if somebody notices uh, maybe in their user profile, their contribution history, 
a bunch of transcription they wrote has been deleted, making it easier for them to let us know that that's taken place. So that's something we're working on. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it always comes. So <laughs> I know what the questions uh, usually follow. Um, but in terms of does somebody moderate the content, no. And the same way that it's not feasible for Lack to um, transcribe and translate and add all of this metadata uh, just with our own employees, it's not feasible for us to moderate all of the content. If we wanted to moderate every piece of transcription that was being contributed, we would not be able to open our whole collection to transcription. We would have to only run challenges uh, like the Coltman Report and Lady McDonald's Diary pilot projects that we did, um, and we would only be able to do maybe a couple hundred pages every six months or so because the manpower that it takes to sit and review that text to make sure that it's perfect, <laughs> um, it's just not feasible when we've got a lot of other projects on the go. So instead we're looking to um, I'll, like sort of empower the crowd to do that on their own, um, review each other. In our guidelines, we've uh, requested that when you're transcribing something for the first time, or if you're the first contributor, you should always be setting the status to needs review, because we want every piece of information to be reviewed. So even if you finish transcribing an entire page, you should always set it to needs review. That's another opportunity for the user account system to uh, improve the process as well. Uh, we've talked about maybe in the future, if we have those sort of verified reviewers or people who have reached out to Lack and said, I really like editing content or I really like collab and contributing, um, maybe verified reviewers would be the only people that could mark something complete. We'll see. It's one opportunity. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So we've got like more trusted users, different levels of users, maybe in the future. Right now, we do not. Um, and that's the next question is, are there different levels of trans um, contributors? Um, question, what technologies have you used for creating Colab? So um, Colab was developed, it's an in-house application by our IT branch. So. Um, I wish that we, I could say that we used um, a piece of open source software to do it, especially with what this day is all about. But that's why we're hoping to be able to package parts of our code and publish it for use by other institutions, other community organizations, even you know a 19-year-old who just wants to track their family history and sit with their grandparents and identify people in their photo albums. We want to publish the source code so that that might be possible with something other than just our databases. So that's in, you know, a maybe. Um, good question about technical debt and about the development to release cycle. So um, this project was developed on a typical waterfall project management cycle. Um, as I've said, we've had those kind of challenges of um, release the thing and forget the thing uh, and don't touch it again. So that's something we're trying to address right now and trying to um, get sort of that buy-in from the entire institution that this is, this is only the start um, and we need to sort of continue in an agile way, not in a sort of traditional project management way. But I will say that the, we do have this opportunity because the collection search beta project is an agile project. And they're doing two-week iterations, so two-week cycles. Um, they've been going for about a year and a half, almost two years. And the collection search beta, they took over a year to get to their minimum viable product, but now it's out there and they are continuing to do uh, these two-week iteration cycles. Uh, and it's incredible, the amount of work that's being done. Um, so we have this opportunity to sort of partner collab up with collection search beta because they're so integrated with one another and approach it in a more agile way. Uh, but collection search beta was the first agile project at Library and Archives Canada. So there's only been one, there only is one, and we're trying to kind of move more in that direction. Um, I'll also just mention a little bit more about collection search beta. So that search tool, if you go to Library and Archives website, we actually, we have a whole section drop down menu for online research and there's I think seven different options for search. Um, there's archive search, there's library search, there's ancestor search, there's uh, image search, 
there are advanced searches. Um, and then there are over, if you search by topic, there are over a hundred different individual databases uh, that we call um, gen apps. They are um, being maintained kind of, um, but it's, it's so difficult to maintain over a hundred databases. And if you're a general user coming to Library and Archives Canada, you may not know where to start. So collection search beta is our vision of having a little bit more of a Google-like tool to start your search and search across all of the different databases. Um, so far, we've indexed about 10 of our most popular databases, and that includes our biggest ones, Archives and Library Search. Um, and then a bunch of those other smaller ones, uh, like the uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King Diaries, um, uh, Indian Affairs Annual Reports Records, those all have their own individual databases, so we're indexing them into Collection Search Beta. So trying to build for that most introductory user and not just having tools that are available for what we call our super users, right? Somebody asked about incentives to participate, which is a good question. So right now, there's not much in the way of incentives to participate um, other than the ability to do so, which so far has been enough for a lot of people. And there was another question about how many people are contributing. Uh, we're talking about thousands of individual contributors. Um, a few hundred people, at least, have created user accounts. Um, and this is just in five months. So it's still very new and it's still very experimental. Uh, but so far, it's been pretty popular. Um, I hope that in the future, we can start to work towards incentives, like maybe reward systems for certain amounts of metadata that have been created, for different levels of users, that uh, if you want to go the extra mile and get yourself recognized as a verified reviewer and do a certain amount of work, maybe there's uh, a, you know, a reciprocation that can be done. One example, uh, through project naming for 15 years, um, for, sorry, 17 years, I always say that. Um, when someone identifies, takes the time to tell us the story about a family member, we send them um, a nice quality print of that photograph as a thank you. And so it's recognized at LAC that that thank you, that reciprocity has to take place or else we're gonna lose the interest of the public and I mean, it's, it's gotta be giving on both sides. So um, There's also been a little bit of talk about um, maybe exploring volunteer hours. We've had interest from schools, um, especially universities, um, in terms of maybe course credit of how people can, can interact. I'm done on the Slido, so if you have questions, shout them out. A tax credit? Exactly. That would require inter interdepartmental collaboration, so, you know, <laughs> CRA, I'm looking at you. We can talk. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there are legitimate possible um, like reciprocal actions that could be taken to acknowledge the work that's being done for sure okay i think we're out of time so um, thank you i actually will not be sticking around for the rest of the day although i wish i was but please feel free to email me alexander.haggart at canada.ca i'm alex haggart way on twitter that's probably the best way to contact me um, and uh, i would love to keep the conversation going so reach out thanks <laughs>